Are you ready? Salvador's Pizza and Don't Delight bring you Rochester's first mixed martial art show on the air. It's time for the Cage Clinic. All right, we're back on the Cage Clinic. I am Rich Cashman Jones. I'm here with Sean Stewart. How are you doing today, Sean Stewart? Oh, I'm wonderful. Yeah, I'm it's definitely. actually nice out today, except yeah. for like the 85 mile an hour winds. Yeah, you know, it's you know, we hurricane style winds, but we're doing great. So we got to catch up on some old news. Old news. What was first, Rich? The old, let's go back in time. Since last time we were on April 6th, that would be April 6th, and that would be uh, Sweden. A UFC in Sweden. The UFC on fuel. Um, they they don't give it a number anymore. They call it Musasi versus Latifi. Yeah, uh, Alexander Gustafsson suffered a cut the prior week. Yeah, so he had to be pulled from the fight, and uh, Latifi uh, came in to fight uh, Gegard Musasi. Gegard Musasi, which you know, amazing, went to decision. <laughs> <laughs> Musasi lit that guy up. Yeah, he lit him up. But you know what? He, he lived through three rounds. But uh, there was a. Uh, his Some, face was mangled. Yeah, Latifi. It, it, I'll give it to Latifi for stepping on that short notice for Gustafson, but uh, didn't go his way at all. No, and I'm, other than the last nine seconds of the fight, <laughs> it's you're gonna lose if you don't do something. What? Yeah. <laughs> ding 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 ding. Crap. Yeah. So that that was uh, yeah April six, and uh, that was uh, in Stockholm, Sweden. Yep. What uh, else happened on that card? We had, well, uh, you know, let me trash some names. Uh, on the actual TV card, we had uh, Akira Korasani defeated Robbie Peralta. Yeah, that was a very close fight. Yeah, that was a, that was a decision. And, uh, yeah, it was, you know, it was, a, it was a unanimous decision, but not, you know, it was 30-27, 30-27, 29-28. So someone saw it different. Yeah. Then we had Diego Brandao, Brandao versus Pablo Garza. Yeah, Pablo Scarco that, Garza. That was a, Brandao got the uh Yeah, he got the submission. submission. Boy, that guy has some tattoos, doesn't he? He's pale and he's covered in tattoos. The, the uh, Diego Scarecrow. Brando? No, oh, the Scarecrow. Pablo Garza? Yeah. Yeah, he's pretty pale. <laughs> Big time, man. We saw him beat Mark Hominick, uh Yeah, that's right. When we were in the city here watching the fight. Yeah, that's right. He. Uh, it, it's a shame because he looked like he was doing great in the fight, and then all of a sudden he just got started getting... That was caught it in GSP, right? Yeah. 154, yeah. UFC 154? Yeah. If my memory serves correct. What else happened on there? that card there? On 154? No, no uh, Diego one? Brando. Yeah. Oh, we got uh, Brad Pickett defeating Mike Easton. Yeah, that was a pretty good fight, too. That was a split too. decision. That was a great yeah. fight, yeah. And then, Brad then we, one punch picket getting the decision. Yeah, there. I was going to say, then we had a couple uh, t- uh, We had a couple of shorter fights after that. Matt Mitrione defeated Phil DeFries. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and then Mitrione subsequently got suspended. Yeah. I'm talking about Fallon Fox on Air Hawani show. Yeah, I don't know. What, That's a little shady territory. I don't know what he was got. You know, you know what? everyone has an opinion, and like Ken Shamrock will say, uh, everyone can get in trouble with their opinion, too. And then they had Ross Pearson defeating Ryan Couture, making his debut in UFC, coming from Strike Force. Couture lost in the second, the second round TKO punches. Uh, what would you think of the fight, Ross Pearson, Randy, uh, Ryan Couture? Ryan Couture took some heavy shots. Yeah, I mean it's Ryan Couture's a really nice kid, but uh, you know you really don't want to see that happen. But Ross Pearson definitely outclassed him. And of course, it's one of the few Strike Force guys not to make the. Uh, Come back with a win. Yeah, yeah well, you know, then there's still more that haven't debuted yet. Yeah, like we're going to see them. Cormier is going to show up uh, this weekend. Yep. Um, but then we got Pat next weekend. Pat yeah, Healy. That's right. And uh, Pat, yeah, and Pat. Tarek you know. Safety hasn't fought yet. No, no, he's not, he's got a, he's got a potential fight. I think I saw yep. they announced. Yep. So that was that we missed that that was uh, 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 that was the last UFC on fuel. Yep. Got, April sixth. Yeah, and it wasn't that long ago. And then uh, of course another one we need the Ultimate Fighter finale, seventeen finale, which happened last weekend. And on that card, uh, we got to, they were kind of co-promoting it with uh, Ultimate Fighter finale and Kat Zingano versus Misha Tate. And do you now? I'm not gonna. I'm gonna say something a little bit controversial here. Do you think Misha Tate got implants? I was just wondering. And she she looked bigger this time when I saw her. In a I word, mean, yes. Yes. Okay. I mean, she's, yeah, I think so. I, you know, I remember uh, she's not a bad looking girl. You know, but her nose was double the size at the end of that fight. You know? Oh Jesus, Ken Zagano's knees uh, Ooh. changed that. Yeah. So uh, we wanted to talk a bit about that card a little bit. <laughs> Do you remember uh, when her boyfriend fought and she he uh, she told him just to, uh, you're winning, coast through the fight, and then yeah. he up losing the game yeah. Mitsugaki. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, I <laughs> My was... first thought was, did he tell her to coast through the third round? <laughs> Ooh. Yeah, really. That the don't listen to her. <laughs> 
But I mean, we got a potential, another potential female superstar in Kat Zingano now. Yeah, and Kat. And she, it's not like Misha Tate's stock goes down that much, you know. Well, I mean, man, I I felt nobody so bad knew for Kat Zingano it. coming into it. She fought in like uh, Invicta and stuff. Yeah, and but she, I mean, she's good with her knees. I'll say that to the face. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, she brought it. Yeah, she definitely brought. It. I mean, Misha Tate had that fight, and her her she was doing very well the first couple of rounds. I mean, you know, she did get take, the takedowns. Yeah, there, there was some good. Uh, Good grappling on the ground there. I think Misha Tate could have just as easily as won that fight if if she could have finished it in the first round or the second round. But she uh, she you know she also proved too she can take shots. Yeah. You know I mean, but she got just not that many. <laughs> not too many. But besides that, we saw a middleweight fight between Bubba McDaniel and Gilbert Smith Jr. That ended in a, a triangle, triangle choke, choke in yeah. the third round. Which, triangle choke armbar yeah. type thing. Yeah, it was kind of like the choke. Yeah, like the the Lesnar choking thing, or you know, or actually that was kind of like a. No, 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 he had him in the yeah. triangle choke and just pulled the arm down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then be, after that was Travis Brown uh, um, KOing Gabriel Gonzaga. With those elbows? Yeah. I mean, uh, there's some controversy coming in. I think uh, Gonzaga's team's going to dispute it. But I think he was out and falling when uh, he got hit in the back of the head with an elbow. Oh, yeah, it did kind of look like he might have taken one to the back of the head. But, I mean, you're okay if it's here by the ear line. And, uh, you know, it's the gray area in MMA and refereeing. Yeah, and I've seen guys do worse, you know, so, and not get disqualified or anything, but I mean, he was out. He definitely was out. Yeah, he yeah, was out. He I mean, I don't see really a problem with it. No, and, you know, we, we're, we're Travis Brown fans too, and I mean, uh, but Gabriel Gonzaga has been on kind of a bad streak lately. So. Well, he came back to the UFC. I think he rattled off two wins in a row, but yeah. then this happened. I mean, Travis Brown is one of the more elite heavyweights in the UFC, so. Yeah, and then we, uh, of course, we've got uh, the next uh, fight was the women's fight, Misha Tate and Kat Zingano, and the winner of that fight gets to be the woman coach in Ultimate Fighter 18 against Ronda Rousey. Yeah, and, I mean, and then Ronda then was there. She, she gets looked, the, Kat Zingano gets the title shot too. Did you see Ronda there? Of course, very, I saw Ronda. Very there. cute. She looked very cute. I think she'll be in a she'll be in Jersey next week too. Oh yeah, there's an appearance. I guess they do on Wednesday in New York City. So yeah, I'm assuming she'll stick around for the fight. And, of course, what we're referring to is UFC 159, right? Yeah, Sonnen versus uh, John Johnny Jones. Bones. Um, then, uh, of course, the next fight was the Ultimate Fighter finale for the middleweight, uh, Kevin Gastelum versus Uriah Hall. Yeah, I remember uh very beginning of the season, I'm like, this this Uriah Hall kid's going to be good. Well, after after he, just seeing the one fight. The one fight where he kicked the guy in the head and knocked him out total. Yeah. yeah. It looked like he I'm killed like, him. Wow. I mean, we talked to Chael Sonnen back then, too. Yeah. Jail you know. was probably disappointed because he lost the fight, you know? I mean, yeah, he, uh, split decision What lost. happened was, yeah, your eye hall lost a split decision here. And all the all the credit to Kevin Gesselin, but uh, your eye hall came out flat in that first round. He was showing off, dancing around, not throwing punches. He got taken down really easy, and uh, that cost him the fight. When he was on the TV show, he was damn serious when he was in there. He yeah, wasn't, he, he was just playing goofing. games. He, yeah. It was weird. Yeah. Like, I don't know what he was thinking coming into that fight. I don't either, but uh, he uh, he he lost, and uh, I don't think it hurts him too bad because he does have. They all, as I learned today, everyone from that season seventeen has a contract with the UFC to fight. So if uh, if if and he will definitely fight again. He, you know, he's got probably the most impressive knockout in the past year, and it may you know. Sure, it was a two-round fight, and actually, I was rooting for the other guy. I hate to say, uh, Kevin well, Gaslin. No, I'm not. I mean, I'm talking about when it was on the Ultimate Fighter when he did the knockout. Oh, I, the other guy was actually doing pretty good, and then he just kind of leaned forward at the wrong got time. caught. Yeah, yeah. So he did this this feint, and then uh, he threw that kick. Yeah. And How about the main event? Main event: Uriah Faber defeats Scott Jorgensen rear naked choke at uh, three sixteen of the fourth round. That was a pretty good scrap. It was nice for Uriah Faber. Uriah Faber had the early thing. Scott Jorgensen had a really good third round, I thought. Yeah. It's good to see Uriah Faber come back after. Where does Uriah Faber fit in with the Bantamweights? Yeah, I don't know. He can't beat the best ones. He, he can't, can't beat, beat the Benson best Henderson. ones, but he's right there. You I know, know. you know. Like, it's... the debate's good. He's got to rattle off a couple wins uh, here with Scott Jorgensen, then Ivan Menjavar, uh, February 23rd. Where does he fit in? Does he deserve another title shot? Who's Who's the next guy? That's a good question because every time he wins, Eric a few Coke, in a row, or excuse me, that's the wrong division. But uh, like, who's going to fight the champion, Henan Burrell or Dominic Cruz, whenever he gets back? <laughs> Dominic Cruz, the, the mystery man. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I mean, uh, like, where does your Faber fit in? Who can he have next? Who can he fight next? 
Well, you know that uh, you know that uh, your right favorite beat Hennon Barrow. I mean, so. if he gets another, no, he lost to Hennon Barrow. Oh, I'm sorry, he lost. That was for him. the that's right. interim. Title that's fight. right. That's right. I forgot that that was the. He beat Dominic Cruz one time, and then the last time Cruz beat uh, Faber. Yeah. But I mean, who? Um, if your right Faber gets a win in his next fight, should he get a title shot? I mean, he's lost how many title shots in a row now? You know. Who knows? You know. Well, he's on a two fight win streak. So, yeah, that's what I'm mean, saying. If he gets yeah. a third, like those divisions aren't that deep. No, you're right, not really, and uh, uh, I don't know. I think he should. I mean, you know, he's a, he's a he's a the poster boy. I mean, I know a lot of girls that just like MMA because he's a good looking guy. Yeah. You know, I mean, uh, so I don't, you know, not that that matters at all, but I mean, it, it does come into play sometimes, you know. Yeah. You know, when it comes to the UFC, but uh, he, either way, that was a pretty good fight. It was a good scrap between him and uh, Scott Young Guns Jordan. Yeah, they went quite a long time. You know, it went longer than I thought. Yeah, it was fourth round. Go. Yeah. And, uh, but he so, looked like Jorgensen was uh, coming back pretty good, and then he just got caught there in that uh, fourth round. Yeah, it was a fun fight. I mean, it was you know they've had a lot of good fun fights for you on TV recently. So yeah, I can't complain. I mean, well, this, this week, Saturday, yeah, I say this this weekend coming Holy up. Holy crap! You got probably the best UFC on Fox lineup I've ever seen with uh, you, know, uh, you know Matt Brown and Jordan Main, uh, Nate Diaz, Josh Thompson. Or Tom, sorry, Thompson. No, that's right, it's Thompson. Thompson. Uh, Frank Mir, Daniel Cormier, and Benson Henderson and Gilbert Melendez. That's going to be a hell of a Is this like a merging of the title with the Gilbert Melendez? Yeah, kind of. I think that's the way you're going to do it. That's Gilbert it. ducking Pat Healy. Man- <laughs> <laughs> I'm scared if we actually had talked to him that you were going to... Oh, I was going to I was gonna ask. <laughs> Don't you worry. But on the undercard, you got Chad Mendez taking on Darren Elkins. I mean, the undercard's pretty... Joseph Benavides is fighting... Uh, Darren Uni, what's how you say it? Darren again? Uinoyama. Yeah, that's how you say it. Our buddy Dwayne Ludwig's busy again, huh? Yeah. Oh yeah. Let's see. T.J. Dillashaw, who go? Yeah, T.J. Dillashaw just fought yeah, at UFC Jorge, 158. Masvidal's taking on Tim Means. I mean, yeah, Masvidal's making his uh, UFC debut here. Yeah, there's, there's, there's. It's a great undercard, man. I tell you, definitely be watching that on FX before the Fox broadcast. Yeah, that should be great. Yeah, that and uh, you know uh, that's. Uh, so we want a break here. Yeah, let's go to a break, and then uh, what are we going to come back with an interview with Ken Shamrock? Yes, we will. All right, you're sounds li- good. You're listening to Cage Clinic. I'm the cash man. You are? I am Stu. And, uh, I'm the world's most dangerous man. No, and we'll be back with Ken Shamrock on the flip side. Thank you for listening, and don't forget to come right back after these messages. How's it going, Alan? That's a great t-shirt. Where'd you get it? It's my Pain Clinic t-shirt, the official t-shirt of the Pain Clinic Pro Wrestling Talk Show. I got it off their webpage. How can I get one? Well, you go to feelthepain.net and click on the t-shirt link. It's going to cost you $20 with the shipping and handling included. Remember, go to feelthepain.net. Get your shirt today. They're going fast. Yes! Rock and load! Rock and load! Bring on the pain! I'm UFC heavyweight Kane Velasquez. And you are listening to the Cage Clinic on Sports 1280 WHTK. Now on the Cage Clinic is a former King of Pancrase, UFC Hall of Famer, and many, many time wrestling champion, Ken Shamrock. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. <laughs> My first question I like to ask is uh, what got you started in the martial arts grappling and fighting game? Uh, necessity. <laughs> Actually, I started when I was young, uh, fighting on the streets and. Um, quickly learning how to defend myself and in my territory. And then as I got older, I got an opportunity to play some sports. And then um, as I grew a little bit older, the opportunity came to participate in a mixed martial arts um, uh, organization out of Japan. And that's really where I got my first taste of um, that feeling of going in the ring and being able to dominate another human being. And ever since I had that feeling, it just never stopped. I just kept moving forward, and, and uh, next thing you know, on UFC and capturing that title, and here I am today. So, you know, it all started from that one feeling <laughs> of walking in the ring and being able to dominate a guy in Japan in front of 17,000 people. Now, going into UFC 1, what were your thoughts and feelings about the event that was going to happen? Did you realize it would turn into what it is today? You really don't think about that. Well, at least I didn't. Um, you're pretty much in the moment. You're basically wrapped up in your mind, uh, trying to figure this new thing out. Um, my whole thought process was to be the best there ever was um, and take out anybody they put in front of me. And I focused on that. I focused on my training. I focused on my opponents. I focused on being the best. And so I really didn't understand what it was going to be 
until late, many, many, many years later when I could actually look back and reflect on it. You started in the world of wrestling, didn't you? Did you? Uh, I read that you had been trained by Buzz Sawyer, and that uh, you know we know Buzz had a wild reputation, but you you did a little bit of wrestling before you got into the mixed martial arts. Yeah, you know, I was sorry. I used to go up to Sacramento, and I was uh, doing some bouncing down in uh, Reno, Nevada. And he uh, had a school down there, and so I went down and kind of played around in the school a little bit. And he would take me and use me to go in and take guys, and they would come in and pay money for a tryout, and I would beat them up and make them quit. <laughs> that kind of was my role. But I learned a lot from Buzz, you know, even though he had his issues. Um, he did extend a lot of uh, knowledge my way to help me further my you know, obviously, getting in WWE and, and, and working with Nelson and Gene Anderson later on, it really gave me a huge upstart, just kind of understanding what he went through and a little bit what it took and watching him go through a lot of uh, his ups and downs. So it did. I got educated pretty well through Buzz. Now, were you a fan of wrestling growing up? Is that something you, you kind of wanted to do, or is it just a necessity, once again, to, to you know, to make some money? No, I wasn't a fan at first. Um I really didn't watch it much. My dad did. My dad was the one that lured me in the direction. And then once I got involved with it and I watched the effort and the, how hard it was to do day in and day out and the commitment you had to put into it, then I developed a different attitude towards it. And then I started becoming a fan. Uh, and, was, and and it became almost a competition to me, too, to also um, dominate it, to, to understand it and dominate it. I was gonna say, and you, uh, and I mean, you, there's guys now like King Mo who are trying to do both. Do you think is that is that difficult to be able to, you know, do MMA and also do pro wrestling at the same time? I mean, is it like you have to switch something off in your head so that you don't hurt somebody in the world of pro wrestling? Um, you know, I think that some people just can do it. You know, there's really it's just not a thought process. You just understand what ring you're in, and you just go. And so there's some people that can do it, and some people that can't. I was fortunate enough to be able to go for MMA into pro wrestling and be very, very good at it. There's a lot of people that cannot do that. They can be okay at it, but they can't be very good at it. Now, uh, going back to MMA, you fought another legend, Hoist Gracie, twice. I was kind of wondering how you thought about Hicks and Gracie. Would he have done well in the UFC since he was probably the most aggressive and skilled of the Gracies? Uh, again, like I said, um, you know, styles make matches, and, you know, I would have loved to see Hickson go in there. I think he was good enough. I think he had enough skill. He was strong enough. He was better than Hoist. Um, without the gi, with the gi, I think they were pretty, pretty, uh, pretty challenging and with each other. Um, but uh, Hickson just had this thing, you know, and and it was a real shame that he didn't get in the U.S. and that he didn't prove himself because I don't think he's ever going to get the credit that he deserves because he didn't fight. Yeah, I kind of feel that same way. Uh, another thing I want to ask you about, being a member of the UFC Hall of Fame, do you think uh, Frank Shamrock will get his respect one day, or will the bad blood prevent that? Well, you know, first of all, it shouldn't. Second of all, they shouldn't have somebody that has an opinion of somebody keep them out of the Hall of Fame. Uh, if they haven't done anything to keep them out, then they should not be out. Um, to me, uh, my belief is is that the Hall of Fame isn't what it should be, it shouldn't be the Hall of Fame of MMA. It should be the Hall of Fame of the UFC. Uh, that I understand. But as far as Hall of Fame of MMA, it is not. Now, who would you, if there was like a, a non-UFC Hall of Fame, who would you include in there? Well, you know, first of all, Frank deserves to be in there without a shadow of a doubt. Um, you know, I think Mark Coleman is there. Um, definitely Sakuraba. Um, there's a few Japanese kids uh in, in Japan during the times that I was there, like Funaki, uh, Suzuki, some of those guys uh, in the earlier years that definitely belonged in MMA. Um, so, you know, I don't know. It just, uh, it, it'd be hard to sit down and go through all the names, but, I mean, there's at least 30 guys that should have at least a mention or an opportunity to have the opportunity to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. And all we're doing is focusing on what we see here in the UFC, and that's not, that's not a Hall of Fame. Now, going back to your uh, your few fights in Pride, was there some shady stuff going on over there with, like, uh, decisions and judging? Yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, like I said, it's, it's, uh, you can say all you want to say about it, but, I mean, it's, it happens. And, you know, who's to say it doesn't happen in everywhere? So it is what it is. Um, I can't tell you anything that for certain happened. And if I, if I did, I still wouldn't. If I knew for sure, I still wouldn't because it, it hurts it hurts the business, and it hurts the other fighters trying to make a living. 
So, you know, hopefully we can have sanctioning bodies to keep things clean and not allow one person to be able to influence judges or, or to influence um, referees. Now, uh, a lot of people, uh, I've read this in many places, uh, say that your rivalry with Tito saved the UFC, moved it to where it is now, moved it up. And in Ultimate Fighter Season 3, you were both you were coaching against Tito's team and show port- kind of portrayed you in a bad light. Uh, why do you think this was done in the editing room? Well, I, I think a lot of it has to do is because the actual show itself is mine. Um, they took it out of my book because I ran the fighter's house. That's what I did. That was my concept. And I guess they felt by putting me on the show and then discrediting me on the show made it feel like it was more their idea because I couldn't do it on the I couldn't put a team together on the show. So, and by, you know, so by doing that, I think it just kind of gives them more credibility about not having any issues with running the show and someone saying, oh, yeah, by the way, that's Kim's trying to discredit me on the show. I was going to say, you think a lot of people who came out later and said that that was, you know, completely, you know, wrong, like Roy Nelson and a few of the other guys. And uh, it's good that, you know, we get that perspective, too, because it could have been a different thing altogether than what came out. Yeah, it was definitely, it definitely isn't me. It's not how I train people. Um, I, I'm the kind of guy that takes people, put them through a tryout, and I only take the ones that want to be there. I was forced to have those guys, and a lot of those guys did not want to train. And therefore, I am not going to break a sweat trying to show somebody something that I've learned and took me all my life to learn and show them and give them something that they don't want. Cool. I'm going to ask a quick wrestling question. I'm a huge wrestling fan of yours. I remember seeing you at WrestleMania 13 uh, roughing the match between Bret Hart and Steve Austin. That's the match that kind of made Steve Austin stone cold, where the fans turned and started to support him. Did you get the feeling during that match that it would end up making Steve Austin the hero and Bret Hart the uh, heel after that match? Did you feel the crowd change during the match? Uh, Absolutely. You know, the whole idea of that thing, I knew what Vince was going for. Vince had to change his concept. He had to get more edgy. He had to push the envelope because WCW was eating him alive and taking all his talent. So Vince was very smart to go out there and find somebody that didn't fit the mold of a wrestler. They went out and found somebody that was edgy, someone that pushed the envelope, and something that he could turn into his pro wrestling organization, and that was me. Um, and as soon as they did that, then all of a sudden you see Goldberg pop up, and as like an MMA guy, but he never was. But they billed him, and he did very well at it, and, and hats off to him, and he never fought one MMA fight in his life. And, uh, so it was, I thought Vince was very smart at what he did. He pushed the envelope, he made it real edgy, he put Stone Cold over as this guy that hates authority. And people at that time, I think, bought into that because a lot of people were in a bad way and authority was something that people didn't like, I mean, like bosses and, and warehouses and different things that people were, were working in every day having to deal with bosses. And so Stone Cold was that event for them. And then also, too, you had MMA, which was really huge at the time. And you had me in there, and it made it real almost almost legitimate when you had Bret Hart and Stone Cold um, going at each other with an I Quit match, and they were beating the tar out of each other. And then when, when Stone Cold wins it, I mean, now that people have their own superstar and their own heavyweight and hero champion in MMA, which was in Stone Cold Steve Austin, because I, I basically solidified it by reffing it. I definitely say so, and it's like after that, it seemed WWE did pick up kind of uh, the uh, MMA. They wanted they brought in Dan Severin and uh, Steve Blackman, and uh, did, did they have more visions of you and Dan Severin going at it more than really than what happened between you two? And while th- he was in the WWE, were there was there supposed to be more to the story between you two? Yeah, there was, but uh, um, uh, Dan was just too flat. There was just nothing there. Um, and I think Vince saw that when he tried to build a program with us. And I, I didn't like it. Um, I went with it. But uh, Dan just was like a board. I mean, he just was nothing there. And so they tried to put this thing there. And then when, Vince, when Vince first saw me him get in there and do, do the match, he knew right away that it was not going to work. And that's why you didn't see Dan anymore. I was going to say, Dan, was he was. He was kind of, you know, very rigid and cardboardish, but, you know, he was – in the ring, yeah, it's a shame because that looked like you know it looked like they could have built to something really huge, you know, uh, you know, buying our, or stealing from the MMA world a little bit. To the and this is way before what how UFC is now seen, you know. 
Uh, right. You know, so, but, you know, another thing is you brought the ankle lock to the WWE after, and after you left, it seems like a couple of maybe the legitimate wrestling guys who were, you know, amateur wrestlers and Kurt Angle and Jack Swagger both kind of taken over the, the ankle lock. What do you feel? How do you feel about that? Did they ever call you and say, hey, do you mind if we do this? Or is this something that they, they just, they, they kind of developed on their own after seeing you do it? No, they did it. They took it over and did it. And I kind of laughed. And I says, I remember making a few comments about it. I said, I said, if Kurt Angle's going to use the ankle, at least he can do is do it right. It looks stupid the way he does it. Yeah, he does. He kind of rolls around to a little bit, and he holds him, <laughs> yes. he holds him way up. It doesn't work. Yeah. It's like, if you're going to do it, do it right. So everybody believes it. Very cool. Now, after winning uh, the King of the Ring, you won the King of the Ring in 1998, and that's not a lot of people can say that. Uh, it's even better than a championship at the time, but usually you're led into the championship series after winning it. Why do you think that didn't happen with you after you won the King of the Ring? Uh, I'm not sure. Um, you know, I know I made some mistakes in there, so, you know, I got caught up in the road and getting tired and not focusing, you know, so, you know, maybe they lost, maybe they lost faith in me. I, I don't know, but. I do thought I, I thought I should have had a shot or at least an opportunity to, to do it because I, I thought I was carrying the show. I thought when I had the opportunity to carry the show that I did it very well. And uh, but they uh, for some reason never gave me the torch. Um, and I and I don't know the real reasons why, but uh, obviously I'm sure they have their reasons. Very cool. Uh, I was going to say, we, you know, you, you weren't the only one that uh, that they, they kind of dropped the ball with the King of the Ring because I think Billy Gunn the same thing happened with him. And uh, maybe they just changed how they were going to do things. But uh, now you left the WWE in 1999 after an injury. I know that you were working with Chris Jericho and I think it was Mr. Hughes or something. What actually happened? I know you hurt your neck, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I injured my neck and it was pretty severe. So uh, that really limited me on a lot of things I could do. And uh, but but you did come back eventually, and you worked with TNA for a short time in winning their the NWA Heavyweight Champion in their first. Uh, pay-per-view, which was great. We thought you were going to be there for a year. I wasn't really sure what was going on at that time, but uh, you came in and won that battle royale to start the, to to take the title. That was it looked like it was a fun time, and you did get to take on some guys from all over the world in the first couple of weeks of the show. Uh, it was fun. I had enjoyed it, and I was I was I was greatly appreciated that they had enough confidence in me to drop that strap on me that soon. So um, TNA, I really appreciated what they did. But I think that what happened as soon as I took the strap. I think that there was uh, some confrontation between um, Jeff Jarrett and his dad about which direction they wanted to go. So immediately after I took the strap, they wanted me to, you know, drop it back off again. So I think it was, it was because I couldn't go. I was I couldn't go every time. So I think that they thought maybe we we needed someone that was more of a, a, a current champion that would be there as much as they needed them to. So, but you know, I don't know. I, I, again, like I said, I I really appreciated the opportunity and for them to give me that chance to be able to drop the strap on me, but I don't believe I really even had a shot to even carry the show with the belt. I had to drop it right after I got it. Yeah. Are you surprised they're still in business? Because it seems, you know, I mean, it's it's almost, it's over 10 years now, and uh, it, uh, they've had to change their whole company, how they ran things, and uh, try, and you know, and the pay-per-view, depending on pay-per-view revenues, didn't really work out doing a weekly one for them, but they're still here, and uh, I know you came back and did something with them in 2004 for a little bit with Jeff there. Yeah, you know, it's uh, the one thing that you got to do, I and mean, you got to establish a direction, and you got to establish a point that you want to reach, and you can make as many changes as you want, just as long as that you reach that point that you set out to reach in the beginning. Because otherwise, you keep changing your point of direction, and you get lost. And I think that's what's happening with them is, is they don't know where they're going. Now, a lot of people say Hulk Hogan also coming in kind of confused the point, too, because they just kind of dropped everything they were doing to and gave him the golden key to everything there, and that may be some of it. But uh, Coming back to the MMA, Ken, uh, does the popularity of MMA today surprise you at all? Um, it doesn't. Um, I guess it doesn't surprise me, but at the same time, um, it, I didn't expect it either, you know. Uh, it, just, it, just, it just is. So it's like I was focused on what I was doing and, and pretty, pretty uh, focused on what I was doing and the direction I was going and trying to make sure that I reached my goals. So I didn't pay much attention about where we would be at in five years or even next week. I just focused on each day. So to look back on it now, I wouldn't say that it, if I had that I would be surprised because right off the, right off the get-go, people really knew this was something special. Um, the thing that I'm surprised most about 
is all the bad decisions and all the bad comments that were made by the UFC and that there's there's been no, like, flashbacks or bad things that have happened or possibly losing the company. You know, there's been a lot of bad decisions and a lot of bad moves, but yet it hasn't hurt them. That's the thing that surprises me the most. Yeah, Ken, uh, I got, uh, we're in New York and it's not, and the uh, UFC is not, uh, officially sanctioned in our state, unfortunately. Back when you started in the early UFCs, there was really, a lot of the rules, uh, that they have now weren't there. Is the rules, is this one of the po- reasons it's more popular now because of the weight classes and, uh, you know, or, you know, how the, some of the changes to make it legal in some of these states, unfortunately, like I said, it's still not legal here yet? Well, uh, um, I'm not, I don't know, it's like apples and oranges, you know, you had your, your organization then and there was no old barred and there was no rules and it was raw and everybody came from their own discipline and it made it exciting. But those things change, like, you know, now you got everybody that's, there's really no style against the style, you know, other than camps or, or, or gyms, but it's really the same thing all over again, you know, with the same guys doing the same thing, same discipline, one maybe better at something than the other. So, I don't know, it's just like apples and oranges, you know. You can't compare those days with these days. Now, uh, in July, you're returning to the cage in England to fight native legend Ian the Machine Freeman. Why at age 49 do you decide to fight again? Is it like uh, for the love of the game scenario, or uh, is it a case of you getting the itch to fight? Or that I need money. I've heard that one, too. (laughs) I wasn't going to go there. (laughs) Yeah, of course I need money, man. I'm 49 years old. i got another 40 years to live. Of course I need money. (laughs) I know, but um, I'm just, I don't know. I love it. It's what I like doing. If if people go out hunting or go skiing or go ride a boat or go camping or go fishing, those are things people do that, that they love to do that isn't work. Fortunately for me, I love doing what I did to work. I mean, I love it. It's just, it's, I love it. So I'm going to keep doing it as long as I'm capable of doing it. Fans will keep watching. If they keep watching, I'll keep doing it as long as I'm healthy and continue to train. Those are things that I'm doing. I am doing this because I enjoy it, not because I need the money, not because I need to prove anything other than I'm going to. Um, but it's just, I love it. It's just something what I want to do, and it's what I like to have fun with. So... People keep saying, "What are you doing? Why are you still fighting?" It's like, if you can't, well, because I love doing it, and because I can. <laughs> <laughs> that does it. Now, uh, do you have any career regrets at all? Yes, I do, but there, I can never change them. They're only ifs and ands, and what could have been. Um, first one that pops into my mind would be the fights with Tito. Yeah, those are regrets. I wish that I would have stopped and got healed up and fixed up and, and, and injury-free before I stepped in the ring with him. But what can I do? You know what I mean? It was there. It was the time. I didn't have time to stop and get fixed or healed. I chose to do it, and that is that is what it is. I, I took those fights, and I did the best I could. And fortunately, I lost all three of them. But uh, it is what it is. But, the, yeah, that is a regret because I know, being healthy, that it would have been a different outcome. Now, uh, in your own view, what is your legacy, and how do you want to be remembered? Yeah, that's a, you know, that's, that's a good one, because I'm not necessarily, as a legacy, want to be remembered by, although that's, my goal was to be the best, to perform and, and, and do the best I could and be the best. And so those are things that I wanted. But to be remembered by, I want people to know that I wasn't a guy that just rolled with the punches and that did whatever. You know, I cared about what, what went on. I, if something was wrong, I'd step up and say something about it. I just wouldn't roll with the punches. Um, that's how I want to remember by as a guy that stood up for what was, what was right. Awesome. We'd like to thank you for your time today, but before we go, uh, I'd like to plug uh, the Inner, Inner Circle Agency of Canada. It's uh, innercircleagency.ca, and they cater to the biggest UFC and MMA stars. Uh, that's what you're doing this weekend up in Canada, right across the border and all the way to Toronto. Uh, coming up, they're going to have Frank Yeager and Chris Cyborg, May 23rd and 25th. Leodo Machida is going to be there July 18th through 20th. Vanderlei Silva, August 15th through 17th. Bruce Buffer and Jason Mayhem Miller, September 19th through 21st. And Rashad Evans later in the year. Ken, we'd like to thank you so much for your time, and it was a great, great interview. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I, I, I see a future in, uh, in commentating for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they keep telling me that. And when I do commentator, I kill it, blast it, blow it up. You really will, and then they don't call me back. So I think there's some jealousy there somewhere. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much for the time, sir. Awesome. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Ken.
How's it going, Alan? That's a great t-shirt. Where'd you get it? It's my Pain Clinic t-shirt, the official t-shirt of the Pain Clinic Pro Wrestling Talk Show. I got it off their webpage. How can I get one? Well, you go to feelthepain.net and click on the t-shirt link. It's going to cost you $20 with the shipping and handling included. Remember, go to feelthepain.net. Get your shirt today. They're going fast. Yes! Rock and load! Rock and load! Bring on the pain! Yo, baby, this is Bert Watson, and you're listening to the Cage Clinic on Sports 1280, WHTK, baby. All night long, this is what we do and why we do it. That's why we rolling, yeah. Hey, we're back at the Cage Clinic. How about that interview with Ken Shamrock? Wasn't that awesome? The world's most dangerous man. I thought that was me, as you heard before the commercial yeah, well, break. You, um, I'm you also the king be. of Pancras and UFC Hall of Fame. As long as there. Ken's not in the same room, you can be the world's most dangerous man. <laughs> I'm the second world's most dangerous man. <laughs> Anyway, uh, many props and thanks go out to uh, Paul from uh, shownolove.ca as well for that interview. Very cool. They're very the good Inner Circle, to us. Inner Circle Agency. Ca. Yeah, it sounds like a, hooking uh, it up for us. Yeah, and maybe some more in the future. Yeah, definitely. They got a lot of stuff on the plate coming up here this summer. Yeah, but you just got us a king there, man, Mr. Shamrock. Yeah, that was great. Awesome. So now we're going to talk about Bellator 94. 94, 94 March 28th. Yeah, March 28th. Uh, we had a friend on the show uh, who had fought on the card. Yep. I, I always say everyone's a friend after we have them on the show. Yeah, you know, everyone's really pretty much friendly with us, they except for Hector Lombard. <laughs> except for Hector Lombard. <laughs> I don't want to talk about that. He didn't want to talk about <laughs> anything to do with Bellator. Yeah. So we had. And I bet you now he's wishing he was in Bellator. Sure. Oh man, man. Oh, after two losses, you know, and yeah. one, one so so win. Uh, he's going down in weight. Did you hear that? Really? Yeah, he's gonna drop. Why not? You know what? He's he's he's, gotta, he's five two. So I he's don't not, yeah, he's not very tall, but he's built like a brick crap house. Yes, he is. Anyway, back to Bellator. Okay, talking not, about Dave the Caveman Rickles, our that's friend. That's right. He was on the card, but this is ninety four. Uh, it was uh, March twenty eighth. March twenty eighth. UFC USF Sun Dome in Tampa. First fight was uh, Rodrigo Lima versus Ronnie Mann. He defeated R- Rodrigo Lima, defeated Ronnie Mann. Unanimous decision started the show. Yeah, that was a good uh, fight, too. Yeah, there was. There I was... expected more out of uh, Ronnie Kid Ninja, man. Actually, he's not even going by the name Kid Ninja now, so. Uh... <laughs> Maybe he doesn't want a big kid attached to his name. You know, yeah. He wants to be Man Ninja or something. Yeah. Okay. Now, what we, else was there? Then we have uh, uh, Luis Melo defeated Trey Houston. Submission okay. in the third round. Yeah. Uh, of course, Dave Rickles beat Saad Awad. Yeah. And that was a TKO punches in the second round. It was a good fight. I mean, Sadawad came out pretty good. Dave Rickles was bleeding in that, yeah, that first Rickles round. Yeah, Rickles was probably losing. He probably lost that first round. He came back, and uh, Dave Rickles used the power of the cave. He just pushed him. He just was pushing him all over. And he the knocked out Sadawad, and he's going to get the title shot against Michael Chandler. Yeah, and then the main event was Emmanuel Newton defeating Mikhail Zayat. That was uh, a good fight. Which was a close fight. Very yeah, close very decision. Close. One point uh, differential between uh, so two rounds to one. You know, it was a. Uh, and went all three rounds, and so that, that of course, it was a it was a freebie that was on Spike TV. The f- next week, Bellator ninety five ninety five it was from coming uh, Atlantic City. Yeah, man, uh, it was from Revel, I, Revel, right? Yep, Revel ca- ca- Casino there. Yeah, April fourth, and it was uh, that was a live. Um, that was a good card too. That man, was Bellator uh, really had a great season. Yeah, lots was, of fun fights. Yeah, when does it pick up live again soon? Uh, they're gonna do the summer yeah. series coming up in a little bit. To say because uh, in the in the '95, the first fight we saw was Rick Hahn versus Carol Parisian. Yeah, the battle of judo guys. And KO, and it was a KO punch in the second round that uh, Rick a Hahn KO won. on Caro. Yeah, and then we got we got to see Brett Cooper fight again in the next fight. I think it was, uh, I think I'd seen him fight. Well, I mean, yeah, you coming? Rick <clears throat> Hahn was uh coming off of uh, that loss to Michael Chandler. That's right. So that's yeah. a good bounce back for him against a pretty good name. Yeah. I mean, Carl Parisian was due a UFC title shot. Then never ended up having. He kind of got like a little head case thing kind of going on, panic yeah. attacks and stuff. Ooh. And he was addicted to uh, painkillers there for a while. I mean, he looked pretty in that good, aspect, it, uh, mm-hmm. it was kind of hard to see that for Caro, but, uh, yeah. you know, he's got some demons to deal with. Uh, Hopefully he can don't come we all? It. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and then it was Doug Marshall defeating Brett Cooper in the next fight. How about that? Doug the Rhino Marshall yeah. in 2013 winning a Bellator tournament. Yeah. The former WEC champion. Amazing. Amazing. And he uh, Doug he, Rhino has no ground game, but, man, he can hit like yeah, a truck. He's got power punches, man. Whew, Brett Cooper went down. And then, of course, another uh, past guest on our show lost, unfortunately. Uh, uh, Mike Ridgman lost to Frodo Kospilov. Is that Magomed it? Rasul Frodo Kospilayev. Yeah, I remember you told me that last time we were doing the show, and you could pronounce it perfect. They just call him Frodo. Yeah, and he hates it. And, and, I, don't, and I don't think, I mean. I actually saw his Bellator I was debut. Yeah? Yeah. 
I was rooting for Richmond in that fight. It just didn't seem like he... It was a unanimous decision, right? It was, too. How but... did they not give Mike Richmond the second round? Yeah, there was... I don't understand. Yeah, there was... He definitely... Uh... Mike Richmond won at least one of those rounds. Yeah, and... That was a good fight. Frodo definitely won the first round, I thought. Yeah. Uh, he pushed the pace really hard. He did, he did. And... But, I mean, I, I can't really argue with the decision, but it shouldn't have been unanimous. No way. No. Sometimes you wonder about these scorings. And then, of course, the main event... Was uh, Shabulat Shamalayev and Pat Kern for the federal Sh- title, right? Shabulat who was in Rochester the, just the, or a week, less than a week before he fought. Yeah, a few days before. Saturday he was here. And then uh, and by the way, just a little offshoot, that Gladius show. Gladius in, fights? In, Gladius fights, incredible crowd. Uh, unbelievable. Yeah, was, I, I couldn't make it out because I was in the falls that day and gotcha. I came back late. I got back late, but uh, it was, it, I, I was Richie a, here went and uh, it was a you gr- sent me pictures. That crowd was huge. It was, it was gigantic. I couldn't believe it. And the thing is, is they were very, very happy. And the amazing thing is I was looking over, I, I think I sent you a picture of the lineup. And there's like the biggest, the guy, one of the, the, the most wins that any guy had was like three. And then maybe the most fights anyone had was like five at the most. Were the rules any different? Well, <laughs> it wasn't an octagon. It was a, it was a hexagon. Okay. Uh, is that the six side? No, it's a five. Yeah, not it wasn't five. It was a six sider. I actually learned six sided steel. I, I actually learned that you can't can't do an octagon. You can't make an octagon because that's owned by UFC and they own the copyright to it. And you cannot use an octagon. Interesting. Yeah, so it has to be some other shape. So this was a six sided. How do you how do you own a shape? I don't know. So, so I heard about that. that they, how many the how only, many how many palms you, do you have to grease to own a shape? The only place you can fight in an octagon is the UFC. Wow. So, yeah. Uh, the Hex. I, mean, I remember Chuck Norris had a movie called Enter the Octagon or something, but I remember it uh, probably has something to do with that. But never let's say the six-sided one, it was a uh, – it's not a pentagram. It's five. It's a hexagon. So, hex, the yeah, Hex. Yeah, hexagon. So they – and it was, a, it was a great night of fights. There was a couple, you know, bl- knockouts. We got to see uh, the Bomb Squad, the local – kind of Bomb lo- Squad? A couple guys from the Bomb Squad. Ithaca, fight. right? Yeah, they're from around here, and that's where Johnny Bones Jones uh And that's started. why Shabalat Shamalai was there? Yep. Yep. Was he, he helping his teammates out? Yeah, he was there. For, he just did an appearance to the autograph signings and, and just had waved in the middle of the octagon or the hexagon when he was in there. The cage. The, the cage. cage. And uh, but it was great. They had giant screens. You could see the action on the giant screens. There was one vicious knockout that the dude just not did not get up. Were the rules any different? Did they wear headgear in? No, they didn't wear headgear. Amateurs? Someone told me they had to wear headgear. No one wore headgear. Yeah, I was wondering about the rules. Yeah, it was the same as UFC. It was the same as, you know. MMA, and, regular MMA? Yeah, yeah, regular MMA, you know. Just amateur? And, yeah, just, yeah. And, uh, well, they got a show coming up in June, right? Yeah, they're going to be coming back here. So All right, I'll, hopefully I'll make it out to that one. Yeah, they, they were, and they were really very kind. I got a nice shirt, too, from them. Uh, oh, yeah? I paid for it, but I wanted it. To, you know, it said MMA New York on it. So. Uh, oh, yeah, cool. Uh, but it was it was a it was definitely a lot of fun. If you get to see any once it becomes once it becomes legal in New York, it'll be a lot better competition in shows like this. But they'll be everywhere, which we cannot wait. But nevertheless, yeah, Shabalot, Pat Curran and Shabalot Shamalaya. They they he you was say he's a nice guy. Unfortunately, things didn't work out for him uh, no. in the Bellator. Well, Pat Curran's uh, a great fighter. Oh yeah, yeah. Pat Curran's a really good fighter. Yeah, he's a, and Shabalot Shamalaya was supposed to get the, he got the fight that was supposed to be our our guy Daniel uh, Strauss, right? Yeah. Wasn't he supposed to get that next fight? He's, Daniel Strauss is still lined up for it. Is he? He's got those legal issues. Sure, sure. I so. mean, we'll see. Pat Curran got the submission with a, a really slick choke. Yeah, yeah. He just kind of locked it in, and then, uh, you know, Shabalaya, Shabalaya was out. Yeah, and I... I and then, like, he woke up, and he was so mad. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, at least I mean, you're not he was out, man. At least you're not injured, you know, when, when you do wake up. So, so he'll yeah. have to enter the tournament again. Toughest yeah. tournament in sports. Well, that's okay, because, I mean, this tournament is... Uh, you got to get better to, to, yeah, to get to the finals. Yeah, Curran. Uh, Big time, man. Frodo is in line for a tunnel shot, too, right? After beating Mike Richmond? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So, I mean, either him, uh, Kaspelaya or uh, Daniel Strauss, I guess, gets the next shot at Pat Curran. Well, I mean, you know, and that that effectively ended the the season yeah. of Bellator, it was season eight, right? It was an exciting season. Oh, I think all the li- lots of good moments. On all Spike. the all the live Spike fights. Could, TV couldn't probably be more happier with the way that season went out. Oh, I agree. I agree. Oh, it was good. And it's going to draw more guys coming in too. A lot more guys who are, you know, maybe Bellator signed someone uh, we we know. Oh yeah. Yesterday it came out a little bit. Who's that? Bjorn Rebney took a picture of his office. He's like, uh, it's a little messy in here. I think we need the janitor to come in. Oh, yeah, really? Vladimir Machyshenko. Oh, really? Uh, so uh, it looks like Vladimir Machyshenko's going to enter the uh, light heavyweight and, tournament. And they also, didn't they sign, oh, no, they didn't sign, remember when uh, UFC had those cuts? Uh, they had, like, cut 11 guys or whatever? Yeah. And they didn't pick up any of those guys, because it was I mean, FC1, was it, that... Uh, 1FC? Uh, 1FC that, uh, what was his name who went to? The the biggest name that got cut. 
Bibiano Fernandez? No. Oh. He's the one that they said signed in the... Oh, uh, maybe that was... Back right. in the day. Yeah, one of had a show, too. It was really good. Yeah. Uh, Brock Larson defeated Melvin Manhoff by decision. Or maybe he finished him in th- at the end. I can't remember. I don't know. I got home from work, and I watched it in the morning immediately because it was live in Japan. And uh, Shinya Aoki won their uh, lightweight title as well in 1FC. Uh, a guy I met in Cleveland for the Eddie Alvarez fight for Shinya Aoki, uh, Eddie Ng. Yeah. He, he got a big win, too, against uh, some French guy. Arnaud something or another. It was early, and I was tired, so I can't remember <laughs> the name. It's kind of like... Anyway, Eddie, Eddie Ng looks like a, like, a, like a really good prospect. Very cool, very cool. So that's one FC. Uh, speaking of legal issues, you hear about Josh Rosenthal, the, refer- the referee. Yeah, he, well, second he let his uh, con- his uh, his uh, what is it his uh, his license his expire? license expire his referee he, license he got arrested. Yeah, he had a lot of pot plants in a warehouse he owned. Apparently so. What they said the street value was like three million or something. Yeah, it was. Holy crap! Thousands of plants. I guess we're not going to see him in uh, r- uh, roughing any matches. Uh, in the, he's going to be in the clink. He'll be in the clink. Oh, maybe his good friend uh, will... He's going to referee the matches out. in the jail, in the prison. Yeah. That's right. He'll be, he has a new job. He's going to be facing a couple of years, I think. That's with a plea deal. Really? Yeah. Oh, boy. Stay away from the wacky weed. Yeah. Uh, try to. <laughs> yeah. And if you do, don't grow it in your freaking... In your pool, in your backyard or something, you know? Yeah, definitely. But, uh, wow. That, yeah, that's some big news. Yeah, we all caught up now? We are all caught up now. So. Wow, that was refreshing. Hey, we got to go to another break. We're all caught up with the news. You are listening to The Cage Clinic. I am the cash man. You are? I am Stu, the I second. Am Iron <laughs> man. The world's most second dangerous man. And we'll be back after these most important messages. They're not important. That's or maybe they are. Who maybe knows? they are. We'll find out. Keep listening. How's it going, Alan? That's a great t-shirt. Where'd you get it? It's my Pain Clinic t-shirt, the official t-shirt of the Pain Clinic Pro Wrestling Talk Show. I got it off their webpage. How can I get one? Well, you go to feelthepain.net and click on the t-shirt link. It's going to cost you $20 with the shipping and handling included. Remember, go to feelthepain.net. Get your shirt today. They're going fast. Yes! Rock and load! Rock and load! Bring on the pain! Hi, this is UFC welterweight Rory McDonald, and you are listening to the Cage Clinic on Sports 1280 WHTK. All right, we're back on the Cage Clinic. I am the Cash Man, Richie Rich here with Sean Stu Stewart, and uh, we've got one more segment in this show this week. Uh, got some great stuff coming up in our next show too. Maybe we'll tease it at the end. But right now, we got to talk a little bit about UFC on Fox: Henderson versus Melendez tonight. Tonight, big show, huge show. And probably one of the best Fox cards I've seen, um, even the undercard. The last one was really good. This Fox the, card. All right, let's start at the undercard. Who okay. got Richie? Because well, the there's a fight I want to. All right, let's talk about the fight I want to see the most. Okay. Matt Brown and Jordan Young Gun Mean. Yeah, that's, and that's the first fight of the on the Fox. Is it channel. on the Fox? It's a, okay, I didn't know if it was on the uh, yeah, prelims before that or not. Yeah. Man, I am so looking forward to that fight. Both guys are savages. Yeah, and it's uh, man. I'll tell you, they've got some some. Of course, Matt Brown, a former guest of ours, and yeah, Jordan yeah. Meehan, he just fought last month in uh, Canada up in uh, Montreal. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Knocked out Dan Miller. That's right. That's right. And he was on he was on the undercard then, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So let's look at the undercard. We'll start off with the Bantamweight. T.J. Dillashaw is taking on Hugo Viana. T.J. Dillashaw coming on short notice. He last fought in uh, Montreal as well. He got the... Uh, the knockout victory over a say tomorrow. Yep, and then and this is the undercard. I'm saying, okay, folks. The under undercard. Under, uh, this, this is well. There's an under undercard, which is the preliminary card on Facebook. I'm not going to touch those fights, but uh, this is the preliminary card on the FX channel. There's six fights on this card. This is uh, I've seen better. I, this is better than some UFC pay per views I've seen. Okay. Oh yeah. Because then you got Tim Means taking on Jorge Masvidal. George Masvidal. Yeah. Yep. Jorge, George, whatever you want to call him. People call him he everything. He fought Kimbo Slice in the backyard. That's back right. When Kimbo Slice was doing that. Yeah, he was. He had <laughs> long hair then. Yeah, and he's a lightweight too. So. Yeah, he was uh, last rumored to fight Pat Healy in January, but got injured and had to pull out of that one. Yeah. Another pullout yeah. <laughs> for Pat Healy. Uh, and then, we'll uh, get to that maybe possibly coming up. 
Could be. Soon, near your radio near you. And then we have Joseph Benavides versus Darren Uinoyama. U- U- exactly. I was telling Aaron that you always have me say it yesterday. Could, yes, because I can't. She goes, what is it? <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe you. I'm not very good. I'm not Darren very. Uinoyama. I'm not very worldly with my, worldly with my uh, my verbose yeah. li- uh, abilities. We'll say that should be an interesting fight. Uinoyama looked really good. Uh, well, a couple it's fights. It's ago. another flyweight guy thrown into the the mix. You know, I mean, uh, we could see. We don't see a lot Joe, of different ones. Joe B wins. Does he get another title shot? I think so. I mean, I he didn't lose by too much when he lost. You know, I mean, I, it was a good fight. It was pretty good. You can kind of tell uh, Demetrius Mighty Mouse Johnson uh, no, took sorry. over at the end. Yeah, he did. He did towards the end of the fight. But, you know, you never know what's going to happen. Which I had to call. I, at the time, I kind of called it an upset. But, you know, he's got another title defense under his belt. Yeah. And uh, he's coming off injury. Yeah. I think he wants to get in the Fox card in Seattle coming up here in a few months. Oh, the next Fox card? That would. Be... I don't know if it's the next one, but I know there's one they announced for Seattle coming up. No, there's a few. So anyway, the... maybe Joe B gets a title shot there. Yeah, who knows? But then uh, this is still the undercard, folks. Ramsey Nijem versus Miles Jury. <laughs> Stripper Ramsey from the Ultimate Fighter <laughs> versus uh, another Ultimate Fighter alum, Miles Fury Jury. Yeah. Miles Jury uh, looked good his last time out, too. And then... Uh, um... And that's the lightweight. Of course, we go to middleweight with Francis Karma and versus Lorenzo Larkin. Lorenzo Larkin there. Uh, yeah, Carmo fought in last month too, didn't he? Yeah, it's like these guys are cool. Yeah, they just added a bunch of guys to the card. Yeah, I mean, and this is, unless this card's wrong, and the last one on the undercard is Chad Mendez versus Darren Elkins. Yeah, Darren Elkins coming off fighting last month too. <laughs> so it was uh, Chad Money Mendez. Yeah, remember uh, the show back after UFC 158? Uh, Darren Elkins has what was it five? Five wins in the division in a row. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He's the only one to ever do that yet. The record. Breaker. Does that account Jose Aldo? Yeah, I don't know. Is Jose Aldo fight anymore? Either way, we're gonna see what. <laughs> either way, we're gonna see what Darren Elkins is made yeah, of. Yeah, he does. He's got five straight wins. Yeah. All in the same division. He's the first guy to do that. Yep. He's got like one you know, one loss in his last ten. So that, it's pretty impressive with two losses in your career. And so. he looked good up in Canada the last time out. Oh yeah. So. Who did he fight last month? Fought uh, Antonio Carvalho. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Beat him pretty quick, too, if I recall. It was a first-round uh, uh, TKO. Yep. Yeah, you were there. Yeah, and he, they're like, uh, <laughs> he's like, everyone thought it was a quick stoppage. I'm like, no way. He yeah. was going to get murdered. So then we get to the main card. Uh, Matt Brown George versus Jordan Main. Uh, yeah, that was uh, Matt Brown, a former guest of ours. Yeah, we, gotta, we always root for our former guests. Yeah, we kind of always do, don't yeah, we? Yeah, we have to. And, of course, I always root against the Diaz brothers, so the next fight, Nate. Aaron hates the Diaz brothers. <laughs> Holy crap. Yeah, Josh Thompson, Nate Diaz. Uh, oh, that should be a good fight, too. I'm not really sure what to expect from that one. Yeah, well, Nate Diaz really has Nate disappointed. Nate Diaz has good stand-up. He looked, his mm. wrestling is obviously his weak point, and he's supposed to be good at jiu-jitsu, too. But, I mean, Josh the Punk Thompson is also a good striker, and he has decent takedowns. Yeah. So it's going to be an interesting battle. Uh, then we get to the first of the two main events, I would assume, with uh, Frank Mir versus Daniel Cormier. The Daniel Cormier, the Strike Force heavyweight long, champion. Yeah, the Grand Prix champion, the, making his long awaited debut in the UFC. Against Frank Mir, which was supposed to be the fight that he was supposed to have at the end of Strike Force. Yeah, what do you think is going to happen there, Richie? I, I think, well, I think Cormier is. Uh, I, I'm going to go with him in this fight. I mean, I like Mir a lot, but uh, uh, Cormier's. I mean, it would. You got to look at who's more motivated for this fight how much it means for each of the guys. And, I mean, uh, I don't know. I, mean, I could be wrong. I've been wrong before, and I'll admit it. But I think I think I take Danny Cormier in the fight. I think that he's younger. He's got he's got a lot more to prove. And he's actually looking pretty good, too. I've seen him. You know, he's kind of dropped some weight a little bit. And, uh, you know, he, he's, a, he, well, he's a world-class wrestler, as it is. And uh, Yeah, Olympian. Yeah, so, I mean, he I, I'm gonna I go. got Dan Cormier. He's got the power and the wrestling on Frank Mir. But Frank Mir's done some surprising things in the past. And sure. He's been training with the Jackson's crew. Up in over in New Mexico, so oh. I don't know. He's I, I I guess he's in shape. So he looked. I saw a picture. Of him. Yeah. I saw a picture of him. He looked great. Did you see that Road to the Octagon show last Sunday? I believe it was. No, I did not see that. It was really good. Yeah. Yeah. They, uh, but I did see Frank Mir doing. You know, he was interviewed about something or another, and he just looked like he was in great shape. So this is going to be a good fight. <laughs> I mean, you know. Yeah, Frank Mir had a really cool quote on that Road to the Octagon show. Let's see if I can bring it up here. Frank Mir is. Uh, uh, you know, the thing is, is sometimes he, you know, I mean, like, I, I can't ever forget that Roy Nelson fight he had where it looked like he just was gassed after the first round. He won, though. I know he did, but they he were, controlled, uh, they, were leaning, they were leaning on each other the whole time. 
But the fight after that, you know, he, uh, uh, I mean, he's coming off the loss to Junior Dos Santos with a TKO in the second round back in May of last year. That was his last fight. And, of course, he was supposed to fight Daniel Cormier, but was injured in the end of that, you know, for the last Strike Force card. But, I mean, he had a win over uh, uh, Little Nog uh, and Roy Nelson in uh, Crow Cop all in a row. So, you know, one, two, big three. Big Nog. Or Big Nog, sorry. Yeah, I was up in Canada when he broke his arm. Yeah, that's right. That's Nate. Yeah. Ew. Ew. Yeah, that's right. I'm Ew. sorry. Put him in the arm bar until you hear a crack, right? Snap. That's Big Nog, not Little Nog. Yeah, Big Nog. Who's coaching Ultimate Fighter right now against Fabricio Verdum? Oh. Over in Brazil. They're doing another Brazilian one? Sure. You're not going to be able to find that quote, are you? The Frank Mir quote uh, I was talking about on the road to the octagon is, you know what the true definition of hell is? It's when you die and you get to meet the person you could have been. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So I thought that was pretty cool. So it looks like uh, Frank Mir's in shape, and we'll see what happens with that fight. We will definitely see. And then the main event, Benson Henderson versus Gilbert Melendez. Old Gil didn't get hurt going into this uh, fight. Magically, he didn't get Old hurt. Old Gil's one. not hurt now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, former Strike Force champion, lightweight champion, facing uh, Ben Smooth Henderson. So we're merging yeah. the belts. Yeah, it's kind of like a unification, I suppose. Except for I heard that Benson Henderson said there's no way he's ever going to put the Strike Force belt on. Is that what he said? And he said that. That's awesome. What do you think is going to happen there? I, I think uh, Benson Henderson's going to kill him. <laughs> I mean, Gilbert Melendez is on a pretty good fight win streak, you know, but. I don't know, Benson Henderson, I mean, the guys he's beaten to be where he is now are the best in the business. And, I mean, Gil, I'm not putting down Strike Force or anything, but I don't know if the Gilbert Melendez fought the best guys in the world in Strike Force. Yeah, he fought some pretty good ones, but uh, I don't know. Ben Henderson's a different animal. Ben Henderson. Is I have Ben Henderson here, and I think it's going to be a runaway victory. Yeah, well, I bet, you know, I, you know, I hate to say it, and then I hate to under, underestimate Gilbert Melendez because Gilbert, I mean, he didn't get to where he was by you not not fighting anybody. You wouldn't duck not yeah, ducking anybody. Yeah, Ben Henderson's got an endless gas tank. Gilbert Melendez tends to fade in fights, I think. Yeah, so yeah, I've never. So we'll see what happens there. Either I way, it's going to be a great show tonight. Cannot wait. So let's get out of here. We got to get the show wrapped up, and because we got, uh, and why don't we just plug what we're going to do in the next week's show? All right, next week's show we're going to be uh, we're going to have on Pat Bam Bam Healy again. First time since September. Yeah, Pat, and first gonna, time since he's been in the go UFC. Over his wacky timeline for the last eight <laughs> months. It's been. A crazy timeline for him. It's been, been nuts. It'll be his first time First time we've talked to him since he's been in the UFC. Yeah, so. well, this is his uh, first re-debut in the UFC. Yes. He fought there one time years ago. But, He'll uh, be fighting on UFC 159? On the pay-per-view. Yes. Next week. So uh, we'll talk to him next week, so don't miss the show next week. But we got to get out of here now. We will see you all with the Bam Bammer next week. See you. Bye, Andrew.